Okay, this might be a little loud at times because the uh, microphone off my shirt here. Hold on. Alright. This might be a little loud at times because I'm going to be hammering my uh, holes through here. I think. Boy, that's that's thick. I know that it's not quite going to it's not going to go through, so what I'm going to have to do is drill the rest of the way. But anyway, let me uh, get some lines established here. So, Ashland Chemical fired me. My wife left me, took my kids, and I was truly at the lowest point I had ever been in my entire life. I had no family, no friends to help, no one to turn to, and eventually I would gotten well enough where I could uh, work but I could not it had to be a sitting down job I couldn't couldn't be doing any uh, you know hard physical labor because my back just wouldn't take it so I found a job with a trucking company Robertson Transport and it was a really laid-back guy that owned the company uh, he never said when he wanted you to be somewhere he would always say when do you think you could be there and you could tell him three days or four days. I mean, you had to keep your own wallet in mind, you know. I mean, you didn't want to do something in seven days that you could do in four days easily. Or else you just wouldn't make any money. So, uh, and that's just what I needed to at the time. A nice, peaceful, stress-free job. He didn't call you and hassle you. There was no Qualcomm and satellite back in those days. Uh, you got in your truck and you drove and you were left alone until you had to call in and get uh, another load or delivered you know so uh, <laughs> so I worked there about six months and then Paul decided he was going to retire and I don't blame him he was in his 70s and, uh, you know, he was ready to sell his trucks and hang it up. So I got a job with another company called Mississippi Chemical Express. MCX. Not a bad job, not a good job, just a job. All right, now I'm going to be making some noise. And, uh, you know, I kind of banged around working and I'd finally gotten enough money where uh, I could afford a little apartment wasn't much it was actually a one what do they call it an efficiency apartment where it was a living living room kitchen bedroom and that's all I needed was just a place to keep a few clothes and and to crash when I wasn't working so uh, a couple years later after hurting myself and getting fired and my wife leaving me I, uh, I meet Charlie and we get married pretty quickly um, we moved in right away and then a year later got married and almost 32, ye like 32 years later we're still still married uh, by then I had quit MCX and I had gotten a job with a company called John and John and I worked there oh about six months as a single driver and then I asked them if they would let oh no no wait a minute a whole bunch of stuff happened before that back up uh, I worked there for about six months and uh, had worked my way up into better and better trucks and they decided John and John decided that they wanted to open up a terminal out in Odessa Texas 
And uh, I saw perhaps an opening for me to work my way into management. So I volunteered to work at move out to Odessa. And uh, Charlie went with me. And I rented a really, you know, low-end apartment. And I got customers, and I started accounts, and I hired drivers, and I moved equipment out there. And I was scouting buildings to rent as an office that had to have a big enough yard to park trucks. And after about six months of that, it became obvious to me that they were never going to open a terminal out there. And they eventually told me that. They decided not to. So I wasted six months of living in, sorry, Odessa. But if the world needed an enema, the hose would go in in Odessa, Texas. I hated Odessa. The second I got there, I hated it. Noise alert. Yeah, I'm going to have to finish that with a drill. And uh, so I moved back to Louisiana. Jeez, that's not going to come out easy. <laughs> Golly. That is some tough old leather there. Moved back to Louisiana. I continued driving for them. And uh, the next year working for them. Oh, yeah. Okay. When I came back, then I taught my wife how to drive. Because after moving out to Odessa and then me leaving there, because I still had to work. You know, I, I had a little run to Houston and back. Uh, Baytown is actually where I went and uh, she did not like being stuck out there with no job and no husband around for a few days at a time when we moved back to Louisiana she said uh, I want you to teach me how to drive I don't want to stay at home and just twiddle my thumbs so I asked John and John if they would let me teach my wife how to drive and they said yes and like a month later she had a driver's license and we're running teams so a year goes by, and I'm. Uh, they made me driver of the year one year. That that next year, I was driver of the year. That was my second full year with them. Driver of the year. That was you know pretty something to be proud of for me. And uh, about that time, I had done enough things for them, where they realized that I wasn't just a truck driver. I could do a lot of other things, and I had proven that to them. So an opening came up at the terminal I was working at for a new terminal manager. Now by that time I was pretty experienced in the trucking business. I was a pretty good mechanic. I knew trucks. I knew how to work on trucks. I knew how to handle people and deal with people and meet people and be cordial and shake hands and be businesslike. And I knew how to deal with drivers. Truck drivers, by and large, have different personalities than most people, which attracts Truck drivers are attracted to trucking, the ones that stay in trucking, are attracted to trucking for several reasons, and one of them being that people just will leave you alone once you get in the truck, and you don't have a boss hanging over your head constantly. So it attracts a certain type of independent person to trucking, the ones that end up staying in it, that's what keeps them there, is the independence. And uh, so I put my name in the hat for a terminal manager. I was driver of the year I had gone out to Odessa on my own dime now I didn't you know they didn't buy nothing for me or pay me any extra for moving out there and uh, so I, I put my hat in the ring for uh, being terminal manager and we went on for a couple of months no answer no answer they hadn't hired anybody and then uh, I was in a truck stop yeah, I think it was in Virginia. And it was getting to be about the time where I knew they were going to make a decision. So I called them. And they told me that they were going with... The only reason they weren't going to make me terminal manager, and they told me this, was because I didn't have any college. And there we go again. A kick in the face over college. And the guy they hired had a master's degree... And his name was David Stoll. And David turned out to be the dumbest, 
human. Uh, they couldn't have picked a worse person to run a trucking company who knew nothing about trucking. He knew absolutely nothing about trucking or trucks or drivers or people. Uh, he was a bizarre man, and he lost more business and drivers. So anyway, I was really, really, really disappointed. So I continued to work for him. Noise alert. Continued to work for him. And uh, we got a fairly regular run, my wife and I. And it was a nice run. We only worked four days a week. I uh, had three days off, and that was uh, we would drive out to Odessa, Texas, load up and haul that load to North Brantford, Connecticut and then empty out and drive back empty. These were highly specialized tanks. So, you know, we were happy with the run. Uh, life was pretty good. We had a nice little house on the bayou. Uh, I'd bought my first new vehicle. Uh, life was going along pretty good. And then, oh, and we had worked our way into a top of the line team truck, air ride, big sleeper it was a you know nice piece of equipment and it took us a while to get that uh, when we started we were driving a cab over husband and wife team in a cab over with no air ride it was spring ride noise alert so uh middle of winter i delivered my load to north Brantford. i get to north Brantford, and i back into the it's like downhill because you unload from the back of your tanker this particular tanker so all the product rolls back and the customer gets all of the product they paid for so i have to climb up on the uh trailer to open the dome lid so i can pump the product off if you don't it caves the tank in or the pump stops working and it's covered in ice. The, the ladder up is covered in ice, and you have to open this dome lid with a big hammer because the way you tighten it is with a big hammer. They're called dogs. It's basically a, a T-handle that threads down and on these ears, and it, and it sucks the dome lid down on a rubber gasket and holds, you know, vapor and liquid in. So anyway, I have to knock all the ice off of this ladder to climb up on the uh, tank and then I got to knock the ice off the top of the tank and, you know, find my way down. You don't want, you got to get all the ice out of there. You don't want it dripping into the tank when you open the lid because then it spoils the product you're delivering. Noise alert. So I'm just working away up there and all of a sudden I have a slip. My foot slips off the rung and I fall from the top of that tanker onto the ground square on my ass. I broke my tailbone, I blew another freaking disc out, went to the hospital, my wife drove all the way back from North Brantford to Connecticut to uh, Bossier City, Louisiana, Shreveport, the whole way herself. I could not get out of the bunk, went to the hospital, started the whole thing over again that I went through with Ashlyn, only this time it took a little longer to get, get well, and uh, John and John, man, they, they badgered me they wanted to come visit me they wanted to take me out to eat thinking I was home partying I guess and workman's comp paid hundred and ten dollars a week who on earth would give up a, you know a thousand dollar a week job to live on hundred and ten dollars so that's the vibe I was getting from John and John as they thought I was milking it and you can't they had x-rays you can't lie about x-rays and MRIs so that was my second disc I ruptured, noise alert. And finally, I was well enough to get back to work, and it was about two months. And uh, they have given our team truck away with everything in it. CB, uh, sheets, blankets, maps, all my personal property, tools. they would given it to somebody else, and of course we never saw that stuff again. And they gave me a truck that had been rolled and they patched it up. It was absolutely filthy inside. Uh, it smelled terrible. The roof leaked. The mirrors flopped around. It was not a team truck. And uh, I saw the writing on the wall. I knew what they were 
fixing to do. They were going to find a reason. They were going to get me to turn down a load or refuse to drive that truck. And they were going to fire me. So I cut the middleman out. They were going to fire me. There's no doubt about that. They wanted me to come back to work, get off workman's comp, come back to work, and then fire me. That's how it works. Uh, I had gone through this enough, and my eyes opened up enough to realize this is how those businesses do. You can work your fingers to the bone for them, but the second you hurt yourself, they don't want to know you. And they want you off their payroll so you're not a liability. It doesn't matter to them, but I had no intention of stretching this out. I wanted to work. So, my wife and I, we talk about it and talk about it, about buying a truck. It seems like, at this point, that is the only way that I am going to have any control over my future. Is to uh, buy a truck, do, you know, physical labor is out of the question for me. And sitting and driving is something I'm pretty sure I can do as long as I don't got to load and unload and lift up heavy stuff re repetitively. So we, we, I asked John and John if I bought a truck, if they would lease me and my wife on, you know. And they said, no, we don't hire lease drivers. So I said, okay, well, I'm going to give you two weeks notice. And they didn't need it. So my wife and I bought a truck. Noise alert. And it was a 95 Freightliner FLD 120 with a unibuilt, roll-top, Peterbilt-looking sleeper on it. It was uh, kind of new for Freightliner. Noise alert. So, uh, <laughs> I buy the truck, and guess who I lease onto is their one and only competition, which was MCX. MCX wasn't a bad job, and, and the best part of MCX was hauling this one particular product called Molten Polypropylene, which is what we did for John and John. And then there's only two companies in the entire U.S. that haul this, John and John and Mississippi Chemical Express. We went to work for MCX, uh, hauling that, basically to the same customers they hauled to, John and John, and... Uh, when I got my first check, I was freaking pissed. I could not believe I waited so long to buy a truck. I went from making nine hundred, a thousand dollars a week between the two of us to making four or five thousand dollars a week, and it got way better when I found my niche. Uh, so we worked for MCX about six months, and then somebody went and told John and John that. Their old team, Brad and Charlie, were now lease uh, owner operators, not lease operator. We own the truck. We didn't buy it through a company. That's a whole different avenue that I always recommend against the lease operator. Uh, so they called me and invited us back as owner operators, and we went back. And uh, I made a lot of money with them. And that's basically that's the end of the story. But I'll tell you a little more about John and John and why I didn't stay with I'd have stayed with them until I retired. Uh, I liked what I did. I liked what I hauled. I liked the equipment. Uh, the manager was a true dumbass, David Stoll. He had a master's degree, and that's all he had. He was truly a stupid human. He couldn't turn a nut and a bolt. He knew nothing about people and truck drivers and how to deal with the mechanical failures. Uh... He was a terrible dispatcher, so he hired somebody to do the dispatching. Here we go. And uh, he did not miss an opportunity to show you his master's degree, that little certificate they give you. This guy had it blown up to about three foot by five foot, and he put it on the wall behind his office chair so everybody who came into his office could see that master's degree. This guy didn't get his first job until he was like 32. That was his first job. He spent all those years, 14 years that guy spent going to college. And his wife supported him. She was a school teacher. And I'm telling you, not 
he did not miss an opportunity to let you know he had a master's degree. So, you know, the job, David was an idiot, and they eventually got rid of David. And there was several people that went through that office. They couldn't find anybody. At that point, when I was making four or $5,000 a week, I had absolutely no interest in being terminal manager. And uh, I was happy to be an owner-operator. So we went from there. The job, you know, some things happen. You know how your, your tastes change and you're no longer happy doing this. Well, that's sort of what happened. We really started hating running New England. It was so expensive to, to run there. The tolls uh, were just crazy. The fuel was phenomenally higher than anywhere else. And at that time, there wasn't an IFTA, which is an international fuel tax agreement. You had to pay fuel taxes in every state. And the fuel taxes up there were astronomical. So the money you made, you were having to give a larger portion to Connecticut and uh, the New England states than you would in other states. So uh, we decided to uh, lease to another company. And that was Tango Transport. So that is a story of how I sort of got fired from John and John. I hurt my back, and I'd already seen the writing on the wall when I came back, and uh, number one, they wouldn't give us our old run back that we had worked hard for. Uh, number two, I was no longer driver of the year. They didn't want to know me. And uh, they made it very, very obvious that if we wanted to leave and they said you know if you want to leave uh, you know that's your choice uh, you don't have to drive that truck that kind of thing so okay I get it you're not gonna actually come out and fire me you're gonna make life here so miserable that I'll move on I get it I'm just gonna cut the middleman out move on down the road so he we went from there to Tango Transport hauling auto parts for General Motors which is where I truly began to despise unions the auto workers union and the Teamsters union you know I've dealt with other unions that had I had no problem with but the Teamsters and the UAW I wouldn't pee on them if they were on fire Let me uh, see how much of this thread I got. See if I got enough to... I'm going to put white thread on this. Just because that's white and I think it'll look nice. So. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. And eight. That's my formula. To make sure that I have enough thread to go up and then back and I don't know if I'm going to be able to go all the way through but we're going to try it yeah when I uh, bought my own truck my entire life took a sharp turn I started making uh, phenomenal money I mean there wasn't a year that went by that we didn't make at least 225 uh, we hit 300 a couple of years 300,000 now granted uh, I'm not trying to snooker you. You know, we had truck payments, and out of that, I had to pay my own, you know, taxes. But being an owner operator, you had plenty of opportunities to whittle your taxes down. Uh, there's legal ways to do it, and I found them all. Plus, I had a phenomenal accountant whose husband was a truck driver, so she knew all the loopholes, all the ways to get an extra buck in your pocket come on alright got it aggravating so uh... yeah I had a bit of a rough start in life a lot of sadness a lot of pain a lot of pain physically and emotionally but when I bought my own truck and uh... was the boss of my own future my life improved a thousand times over and I never cared about what anybody else thought about my lack of education. I mean, it always bothered me some that I didn't, I don't even have a high school diploma, but I've never told an employer that. 
So basically, I've had to lie on applications and say, yeah, I had a high school diploma. But I joined the Army at 17 before I graduated. So there you have my story. We went to work for Tango. Pretty good job. And uh, we eventually ended up with the best job I ever had. And that was forward air transportation. It was an air freight company. We had a regular run. And uh, it was a hard life physically. You know, it was hard to put those. We put uh, an enormous amount of miles on every week 6,000 minimum, sometimes 64, 65 a week, me and my wife. So, whenever we would come er, occasionally, and this is how women are their own worst enemy. Occasionally, we would come up on women that would say, Oh, your wife goes with you. Isn't that nice? No, my wife drives. She doesn't go with me. She drives, and she does all the paperwork, because I'm not smart enough. So, she does a little more than go with me. She drives during the way, a week uh, during the day, and I drive at night. And that's the way it was the whole time we, we drove. And she had the hard job. All I had to do was stay awake. She had to deal with horrible people. So, uh, you want to finish watching me uh, sew this? I'm, that's the end of the story. I may talk a little bit, but I'm just going to keep sewing on this. This is the giveaway knife here. And if I do talk, it probably won't be much. My dog is right behind you over there, taking a nap on that chair. I got the air conditioner on because it's humid. It rained hard early this morning. And my ditch is working that I... Uh, dug out working great and I'm saving I'm gonna buy that plastic shed it's a lot of money and I'm saving up for it as a matter of fact I would like to thank and I'm gonna tell you his name because he's such a nice guy a generous guy uh, salty shellback put some money on my PayPal and uh, he said it was for the shed fund. And Salty, I may never meet you, but you're a good friend, man. And uh, in this digital age, you don't really need to meet people. You know who your friends are. And uh, you're a good friend, Salty. I've made a lot of good friends over the years through YouTube, and uh, you're one of them. So thank you very much. I think that white's going to look nice, especially with a white handle. And Ricky, and Rob, I can't, I can't name them all, but I have a lot of phone numbers, people I call, we talk on the phone, or text. So I guess I could tell you the last of my owner operating. We had worked for Forward Air for 12 years. When I went there, I had a 99 Freightliner. And uh, I sold that Freightliner to Bev and her husband, Jim, my old friend Jim. And uh, they worked for a couple other companies. And then I told them, man, you got to come to Forward Air. You'll love it here. Great money, great lightweight freight. Uh, we don't run northeast or northwest. We run basically east coast to west coast, but in the south, no tolls. They haul their own freight on their own trailers to their own terminals, so you don't have to mess with outside people. It was uh, If I had found that job when I first started driving, I'd have started with them and never left. Now, I'm not saying there wasn't an occasional problem with a dispatcher or something like that, but those guys, they don't last long. They're there, they mistreat a few drivers, a few drivers quit over them, and the company fires them because they do not want to lose truck drivers. Especially owner-operators with proven records, on-time records. And uh, So uh, I sold that truck to Jim and Bev, and I bought a 2000... Kenworth W900 
with a 3406 E Cat 550. Best truck I ever bought, it was my dream truck. Best engine you could ever have until the EPA screwed up every engine manufacturer out there and made them comply to a new thing called ACERT, which was just cleaner burning engines. Only the EPA could make sense out of making somebody who was previously getting six miles per gallon now get five miles per gallon. That only makes sense to the EPA. So uh, I had that W900, that 2000 Kenworth, and my wife and I put 1,260,000 miles on that one truck with that one engine. I mean, the only thing I ever replaced on that engine was an air governor, the turbo, at a million miles, I replaced the turbo only because I was worried about the turbo going. Uh, a couple of AC compressors and just minor external stuff. I think about that truck all the time. That was the best truck I ever had. Next truck I bought in 2006. Uh, I traded that purple Kenworth in on another Kenworth. And that 2006 Kenworth was like night and day to the... 2000 Kenworth. It was made in Mexico. My first Kenworth was made in Washington State. My second Kenworth was made in Mexico. And from day one, it was a piece of crap. And I kept that until 2008. Uh, and I was glad to get rid of it. It didn't break down so much as everything rattled. The carpet was cheap. Outside, where they're supposed to use stainless hardware, they did not use stainless hardware. Everything rusted. It looked like crap, it rode like crap, and it had a uh, C15 engine in it that had ACERT equipment on it, which sucked. I got terrible fuel mileage. So in 2008, I traded it in at uh, almost 600,000 miles. Now, if you want to do the math, we were getting $1.40 a mile, so 300,000 miles a year. we were doing all right and I traded that in on a 2008 Volvo 780 which was the beginning of the end for me and uh, trucking so uh, we got in a Volvo fantastic truck I absolutely loved that truck but the engine, you could not have built a worse engine. It was a Volvo engine. It was an automatic 10-speed. I didn't think I would like an automatic. But after a month or two, I did not miss shifting. And uh, the engine was the problem. We could not go past a dealer without having to pull in and get something fixed. And, uh, you know, Volvo knew they had a lemon because when they sold me the truck, they wouldn't give me the normal 500,000 mile warranty. They would only give me a 300,000 mile warranty. And that's a year for us or a year and a couple of months sometimes. By then, we weren't working as hard. So uh, everything went wrong. I had a bunch of money saved. Of course, I had a bunch of toys, too. I had campers, boats, motorcycles, new pickup. And still making a lot of money. And, uh, you know, y'all seen my house over there in Sibley. And as land would come up for sale, I would buy it. So, uh, that truck just, it, it ate me out of a lot of savings. And on top of the savings I had to use to keep it fixed, I would lose loads when I broke down. They would take my load. I mean, of course, you know, they can't, it's air freight and people are waiting on it. So I would lose the income from the load and I would lose the savings from having to fix the stupid thing constantly. So about 2011 we'd had enough. Uh, I gave him the truck back. My wife was, she was getting sick. And not long after that, we found out she had cancer. So I got a job working in oil field, had good insurance, which is what we needed driving a truck in the in, in the oil field made pretty good money hard work especially for by that time I'm you know in my 
God, what was I, in my late 50s, mid 50s? Uh, you know, I was at a point when most people in the oil field, they're, at that age, they're trying to get out of it because it's hard work. But I needed that insurance for my wife, and I stuck it out. So we get her through the cancer. She gets healed up. We have, you know, other medical problems besides that going on. And uh, I try a couple of different jobs. And I end up at Martin Transport, Martin Gas, over in Bossier City, which used to be Mississippi Chemical Express. Martin Gas bought MCX out. And uh, I did something I said I would never do. I started hauling acid. I hauled it because it paid better than anything else they had. And I really kind of didn't have a choice. That was the only opening they had, and they had good insurance. So I needed, I needed insurance. And uh, Charlie, by then, she had retired on full Social Security. And uh, that is where I had my industrial accident was with Martin Gas. I got hurt so bad on the job in a plant I almost and I'm not gonna go into great detail but I suffer every single day of my life from that accident and uh, I ended up you know, when people go out on disability, it usually takes them a year to get disability. They gave me my disability immediately. And as a matter of fact, they called me permanently disabled, unable to return to work. Based on the injuries that I received and the MRIs they looked at, and believe me, they, they scoured. They, they don't want to put, on, put, put people on permanent disability unless they <coughs> justifiably have to. So, uh, there you have it. I'll be 62 in a little while, and I'll be going on regular Social Security here in a few months. And, uh, there's no way I could hold a job. I, some days, you know, y'all don't know this, but, because I don't film when I'm not doing nothing. Uh, when I can't do nothing, I don't do nothing. It's two or three days sometimes before I can do anything. And since then, I've had other problems. But, I am not complaining. I've had a good life. It's been a hard life. But, uh, there's been a lot of sadness and a lot of happiness, and it's never been dull. Starting with the Army. So, I'm not complaining a bit. If I had anything to do over again, I probably would have stayed in the Army till I was 37. Because then I'd have had, you know, 20 years in. And then come out and bought a truck. Because I always wanted to be a truck driver. That was always what I wanted to be. And since I drove a truck in the Army, it was not hard to drive a truck out here. Back then, they would take military experience as experience. I don't do that now. You have to go through a truck driving school now. Lots of people ask me why I sew like this. I sew like this because this is the way I learned to sew. I like sewing this way. And when I find something that works and I'm happy with it, I just keep doing it that way. I'm sure there are other better ways. But this is the way I like to do it. And this is the result I like. And I don't mind that it takes me a little more time. And uh, I'm quite happy doing it this way, even though there are other ways to do this. 
and uh, yeah, more than once, many times actually, I've had people, not in a mean way, ask me why I sew this way when there's better ways and quicker ways to do it, and that's why. So in a second, I'm going to stick that knife in here, and we'll have a look at it, see how it looks. Okay, now I'm going to go uh, slick up my edges, get that nice and uh, nice and slick, and then come back and put some uh, black dye on that. And this is ready to be given away. Not long now, uh, just a little over 200 more subscribers. So, uh, you know, this has been a long video. Now you know the story of my life, so this is where I'm at now. That old house got too big to take care of, too much land, uh, too much mowing. I can't even mow anymore because I can't take that kind of bouncing. And I know that you've noticed that I haven't rode my motorcycle. And the reason is my back cannot take, I can ride it a little bit, but that's it. And uh, I'm, I'm hurt for days. So I don't know what I'm going to do about getting better with that. I, I don't think there's any getting used to that. I'm not getting rid of my motorcycle but uh, when I ride it it takes me two or three days to get over it and uh, you know when I do dig around here same thing uh, I'm in the bed for a couple of days or in the recliner there's not much I can't do but I can't do it eight hours a day every day so I'm sure there's people out there that say well why don't you go back to work you fat lazy pig well believe me I would love to go back to work uh, I'm a worker. I like working. Which is why I do as much as I possibly can around here. Because uh, I don't do a whole lot of TV. When I do TV, it's just to sit with my wife for a little while in the morning while we watch the news and drink coffee. And, and then uh, and then I'm out doing something. Even if it's on the front porch, just enjoying the day and thanking the good Lord that I'm alive. That's better than sitting in the house. Okay, I'm going to shut this off. Thanks for watching if you've stuck with me this far. I'm fixing to uh, slick the edge up. I think the last clip will be of this finished. There we go. I kind of like that. I like the white thread too. That come out nice. Okay. Now, uh, Probably uh, another month from now. Let's see. What is today? The middle of the middle of June. Probably the middle of uh, June, July, rather. Middle of July. Middle of August, maybe. Middle of August. Maybe towards the end. The last week of August. I should have enough subscribers to hit my 60,000 subscriber mark, and then uh, I will give away all four knives. So, thanks for watching. Thanks for being a part of my channel. And uh, sorry this was so long. But now you know my, my entire life's history. Well, I just got my truck inspected. And uh, I, I'm kind of a talker sometimes. So I talked their ear off. And I don't believe they noticed my little crack here. So I think I'm good to save myself 500 bucks, And I'm good till next year.